Hi guys. Uh, my name is Benjamin Mashin. I'm an emergency physician. Uh, and this presentation today is part of our webinar series um, on basics of resuscitation. Uh, today we're discussing shortness of breath. So anyone else who read anything other than what SOP is, um, yes, yeah, you should check on that. Uh, so shortness of breath as one of the clinical presentations uh, in a patient who needs immediate resuscitation. And uh, so we're talking about that patient who is uh, almost crashing and uh, needs immediate resuscitation and presents clinically with shortness of breath. So it will not talk about the subtle clinical presentations and we'll go through it. Uh, but uh, just as a recap for those who are not here last uh, week. Um, the main thing about any approach to the crashing patient is what we are calling, it's still the ABCs, but with a bit of a twist and a bit of clarity. Um, so this, uh, does the patient have a pulse? Yes or no. Uh, was there trauma related? Yes or no. And then is the airway open, maintainable? Do we need to intubate? And today we'll be focusing a lot around the breathing perspective. So the rate, air entry, color, effort, saturations, and uh, race is a good way to remember this. Uh, circulation, I think we're covering 20, on 21st, we're covering um, uh, patient presenting with shock. So that we'll be discussing many around uh, circulation. But as you realize from today's discussion, there's a bit of an overlap in terms of this clinical presentation. So it's not always that it's just a breathing presentation or a circulation presentation. Uh, so on circulation, again, you're still using the same races mnemonic. Uh, rate, uh, level of consciousness is using AFPU, color, ACG, SPP, that's the solid blood pressure, and then checking the disability, which is your GCS, people's under RBS. So bulk of the patients today have a pulse for sure. Um, and uh, you pick that up because they have shortness of breath. There's no trauma related in a couple of in our patients today, though there in some instances could be presentation. Uh, and of course, the GCS will vary and it's a, something can easily pick up clinically. And uh, so like you can often look at some of the patients presenting with shortness of breath uh, in the emergency department and how do we resuscitate these patients? Okay, so here's our first case. Let's see, let's put this one up. Uh, oh, yeah, actually before that. so. This is all you're going to discuss today, okay? So the good thing about it is you know the answers already before even the case presents. So when you're looking, when you approach a patient who has shortness of breath, you're still going through your ABCDs. Do they have an airway problem? And some of the common airway problems that present with a crashing patient and shortness of breath is things like anaphylaxis, angioedema, acute asthmatic attacks, COPD exacerbations. These are all airway narrowing kind of problems that you need to really worry about. And then the other thing you look at, to look at is it a breathing problem. Uh, breathing here, we mean looking at the lungs and the lungs themselves are looking at the pneumothorax and the pneumonia could also present with shortness of breath. Uh, from a circulation perspective, uh, we are looking at uh, acute coronary syndromes. Um, so we're looking at acute coronary syndromes and are they, uh, this is a patient who is, will easily present shortness of breath, uh, patients in heart failure, patients having pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade. So this is everything around the heart. Okay. So the heart and the big blood vessels. So the heart itself, you're looking at ACS, heart failure, cardiac tamponade, the vessels you're looking at from pulmonary embolism. But also anemia can be a presentation in, uh, can make patient present with shortness of breath. So something always to remember when you're assessing your circulation. Other things that we can, patient can present is things like anxiety and metabolic causes. And we'll keep looking at this slide and we look at the different patients presenting today and seeing where do this patient fall in this uh, list of differential diagnoses. Um, I know you can break it down and look at multiple, multiple uh, presentations, but these are the key ones that you do not want to miss in the emergency department, uh, or you want, don't want to mislabel the patient in the emergency department, because then that would lead the patient to potentially um, deteriorating further and dying. And that's why this whole is called uh, the resuscitation series, because we're specifically focusing on some of these cases. All right, so let's look at the first case here today. So you are working in the ambulance control room or someone has called you uh, as a doctor or a nurse, someone has called you on the phone, there's a patient in the ED, or you go to the ED and this is the case in front of you. Okay. Ambulance service, patient breathing. Okay, so that's the information you have. Uh, patient can't breathe very well. 
tongue is swollen. Okay. So question. So what do you think the answer is? What's wrong with this patient? Based on the differential diagnosis we have so far discussed. So she's severely short of breath. So as you can see, bulk of you think this patient is having anaphylaxis, okay? And the cue, and that's the correct answer because the cue here was tongue was swelling. You don't have tongue swelling in asthmatic attacks. You don't have tongue swelling in anxiety, but even better, let's just have a look at what happened to this patient. Okay, so we all know it's anaphylaxis. Um, patient is tongue swelling. So the next question is, um, so let me stop sharing. Okay. So answering this one, what investigations do you need for this patient? Patient has anaphylaxis. What investigations do you need for this patient? Patient is short of breath, uh, presents with history of tongue swelling uh, and short of breath. Yes. What investigations do you need immediately for this patient? You have uh, 30 seconds to go. Uh, 10 seconds to go. So patient presenting with uh, shortness of breath and tongue swelling. Okay. We've said she's having anaphylaxis. What investigations do you need? And time's up. All right. So uh, correctly done. Interestingly, though, there none. Okay. You do not, by the time you get any of these investigations done, your patient will be dead. Okay. So in anaphylaxis patient, management is immediate. There is no investigation that is required in a patient who presents with anaphylaxis. Um, and we'll just quickly look at this case and see how this patient gets managed and then quickly go down the algorithm. There's your patient. Okay, she's got heart rate at 150. Okay. We're gonna to need to get you onto the ambulance tummy nice and quickly. It, right, Amy, so we'll go half a milligram of adrenaline. Salbutamol, please. Yeah. Uh, eventually some hydrocortisone as well, all right? Tammy will need repeated doses of adrenaline to help her body fight the reaction. What we're going to do, we're going to give you some adrenaline, all right? It's going to be an injection into your arm. The drug will decrease the swelling and open up her airway. So, Tammy, what you're having through that nebulizer is what we give to asthmatic patients to open up the airway, OK? She was obviously very scared. Um, I mean, if your tongue's swelling and your throat's closing, you're going to panic. What we're going to do, Tammy, we're going to give you some chlorphenamine, OK? But it goes straight into your system through this cannula. Works very well, and it's what we give for allergic reactions, OK? <laughs> Tammy, are you in any pain anywhere? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? My tongue is your, your tongue, okay. All right. What we're going to do, we're going to give you another another drug through here, okay? All right. You're doing really well. All right. Okay. The adrenaline can cause tremors and palpitations. It can be very frightening for the patient, but is a normal reaction as it counteracts the swelling in the airway. We got to Amy and the doctor actually said, well, there's nothing I can do now. I just monitor her because you guys have done it all, which... Uh, which is really satisfying. All right, good. So let's quickly look, okay? So that was the anaphylaxis patient. Um, so let's quickly look at uh, the anaphylaxis algorithm. So um, we'll open that and we'll just come up here. And uh, so this is, uh, the algorithms are available in your uh, casualty app. So for those who have the app, you can easily just have a look at the algorithms. Um, sometimes I forget how to find these things. Uh, uh, anaphylaxis. Okay. Um, so let's just go up in that. Uh, yeah, even I can find them sometimes. So table of contents, um, airway breathing, anaphylaxis algorithm. There we go. All right. So I'm going to share this and discuss quickly the management of anaphylaxis. I just get some of these controls out of my screen. All right, so there. Um, all right, so there we go. All right, so this is anaphylaxis algorithm. So anaphylaxis is essentially any patient presenting with any of the above symptoms. So either mucocutaneous signs, um, which is a respiratory compromise, acute onset of mucocutaneous signs, and one of the following. So respiratory compromise with wheezing bronchospasm like this patient had, and she was a bit also puffy, uh, dyspnea, strider, hypoxemia. They could be hypertensive, syncope, 
and uh, poor tone, or two of the following, mucocutaneous, respiratory compromise, hypotension, GI symptoms, so diarrhea can be representation for anaphylaxis. And then, of course, patients presenting with uh, just immediate hypotension from an, uh, after experience to a known allergen. So management, as you can see, so the dosage, um, you need the adrenaline. So first thing, of course, remove. If it's a beast thing, remove it. If it's something that is on their skin, remove it. So remove whatever is causing the allergy if you can get access to it. The management is adrenaline, adrenaline, more adrenaline. But note, it's not IV adrenaline. It's IM adrenaline given on the thigh. Okay, so the anterolateral th uh, third of the thigh, it's been identified from multiple studies that the blood supply at that point is really good. So, and absorption is almost immediate. But also importantly is, in this patient, times of the essence, trying to find an IV access could cause uh, a lot of delays, which could then lead to the patient deteriorating. But also then IV adrenaline is not really recommended unless in a cardiac arrest situation. Or then as you go down, you will see there's a dilution mode where you actually give some IV adrenaline. So kids under 6.15 ml of the 1 in 1,000, children 6 to 12.3 ml, adults and kids above 12.5 ml. Okay, and you can repeat this every five minutes and that's what the video is talking about uh, patients not getting well but also as you noted in the video patients will present severe bronchospasm so they need to start nebulization and we, as we discuss asthma you'll see what they get nebulized with um and then um lots of fluids okay so patients need a lot of fluids and eventually if your uh, i am adrenaline is not working over time then you can go down the adrenaline infusion route but only if patient is unresponsive to IM adrenaline and fluids. Of note, uh, that video is an older video. Hydrocortisone is longer, steroids are no longer recommended in anaphylaxis. They have not been shown to, any, to have any benefit. Antihistamines also are actually not recommended, apart from just uh, symptomatic relief. They have no real role in terms of management of anaphylaxis. Like for this particular patient, um, she didn't have any itching or anything. And so the role of antihistamines has been really moved out. Uh, it's only beneficial for someone maybe itching for symptomatic relief of such things. But if you don't have any of that for anaphylaxis on its own, there is no benefit for your antihistamines. There's no benefit for your steroids. And this is some recent studies that come out. Um, so main uh, intervention is adrenaline, 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 and more adrenaline, nebulizations for bronchospasm, and also giving IV fluids to uh, push up your blood pressure. And you will potentially need a lot of fluids for your patient. All right. Okay, good job. So uh, I see a question now. At what point do we advance the airway? Let me just tell you, if you have to end up intubating an anaphylactic reaction, you will see all stars. Uh, do not be in a rush to intubate, and of course, unless the point where they've completely shut down and they're not breathing anymore and you've been given adrenaline is not working. And this is not really a patient you will intubate. This is a patient who will do a cricothyrotomy because their airways have closed up. They're, you can't pass a tube through those airways. So they, this is not even a patient. In a patient, for example, who has lost their airway in anaphylaxis, I'll probably just start with a cricothyrotomy straight we can retrogressively figure out intubation, but it's not a patient who you will end up intubating. It's not an intubation, this one. This is a cricothyreotomy, all right? So patient uh, will need that. All right, good. Okay, so let's go to the next patient presenting with shortness of breath. So as I said, uh, for those who came in a bit later, so a differential, so it's an airway. So this lady had an airway issue. Um, after second adrenaline, so adrenaline takes some time. So you will need potentially more than one adrenaline. Thanks, David. Um, so this patient is having an anaphylactic reaction, okay? So the airways are closing up and differential diagnosis specifically for this case would be, of course, she was in a restaurant having, if she has history of asthma, then the tongue swelling doesn't push towards asthma, but the tongue swelling can be a clinical presentation with angioedema. Though patients with angioedema will just have isolated lips or tongue swelling without that narrowing of the airway. So it's not necessarily that often you get similar reactions with angioedema, but it's something to uh, consider, um, okay? Um, and then, of course, uh, it's definitely, the tongue has nothing to do with all the other airway problems patient potentially could have. So in this case, yes, she's, based on the situation, based on the story, she's more of an anaphylaxis patient than any of the differential diagnoses on our screen. Um, and so we don't go down the anaphylaxis algorithm. 
All right, good. How much adrenaline is recommended? Uh, as based on the, uh, no, 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 no. This is not, there's no maximum adrenaline, just an eater on that one. Uh, you give 0.5 uh, mLs, which is uh, 0.5 milligrams of adrenaline IM, okay, every three to five minutes. There is no maximum. As long as your patient is responding, remember the half life of adrenaline is uh, the the half life of adrenaline is uh, what? It's um, three to five minutes actually. So there is no risk of overdose if you give it at the intervals that they are. In UAE, uh, someone is saying they have 0.3 mL uh, pre-filled epinephrine syringes. Now. I know pre-filled syringes normally have large volumes. So maybe Kishok, as you, you can type on the chat, because the adrenaline you're looking for is a one milligram in like an ML vial, uh, because the pre-filled syringes normally have a large volume, which is, I guess, if you have nothing, is good enough. Um, yes, but, oh, oh yeah, sorry. He's, uh, Kishok is talking about the EpiPen. Yeah, you're fancy. We don't have, those ones are too expensive. Your amp of adrenaline drawn up, uh, half an ml of that will work. Yes, EpiPens are the commercial, but each EpiPen is almost like uh, 15,000 or something. Yeah, but it's also just adrenaline. Okay, good. All right, let's go ahead. So here's a patient number two. So you guys listen up and tell me what you think is wrong with this patient. So let's see, stop sharing. All right, so let's see, Paul three. Yeah. All right, what do you guys think is wrong with this patient? All right, good. And correctly answered by almost everyone is a cute asthmatic attack. And you will tell even, so this patient has wheezes, what we call wheezes. He breathes in, then the sound comes. It breathes in, then the sound comes. So this is wheezing, okay? So the sound is coming on expiration, okay? So they're having a uh, narrowing of the airways leading to them to have that wheezing sound coming out, okay? So that's in keeping with an acute asthmatic attack. You could get wheezes with some of these other conditions. You could get a bit of wheezing. If there's any narrowing, uh, then you could get um, some wheezing happening with your pneumonia, yes, and your anaphylaxis patient. Yes, anaphylaxis will have the wheezing sound also happening, um, more or less the same pathology in terms of narrowing of the airways, okay? But the correct answer in this particular case was uh, expiratory wheeze, yes. Uh, how can I get the recording? I need to leave. The recordings are normally uploaded on the Dr. E online or our website. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the acute asthmatic attack algorithm. All right, so this is an algorithm. This is the asthma algorithm. And again, so again, patient will present with shortness of breath. You should be doing peak flows in your emergency department, okay? So many people don't know how to do a peak flow, but peak flows help us to determine uh, where this patient is at, okay? Okay. Uh, but just a caveat on that, do not measure a patient's peak flow, peak respiratory flow rate in patients with impending or acute respiratory arrest, patients who are drowsy, confused, silent chest, okay? Those ones, the treatment is touched immediately, okay? So the peak flow just tells you at what level of narrowing this patient is having and also helps you in guiding your management. And you'll see how the peak flow comes in. So in terms of how you how you do a peak flow, essentially, uh, normally it's a... It's a device that has like a sliding scale of uh, on it, ha put a mouthpiece on it. Uh, and if you speak, I know a lot of you speak to drug reps, any company that provides um, asthma medication will happily donate peak flows to your emergency department. Just ask them. The GSKs and the other companies that manufacture uh, asthma medication, uh, they have peak flows and they can easily have them donated to your facility. So just ask them, they'll give them to you. Okay, so uh, so while the patient is standing, uh, they take a breath, uh, put the pig flow in their mouthpiece, then they blow as, as hard as possible. Um, yes, and for one or two seconds. So it's more of a, okay. So take a deep, 
okay when they are standing not when i'm sitting like i am okay so take three book three paths um and then take the average um of that so whatever that is uh repeat the above and take the best of it sorry the best of it put it over normal so normal is based on patients ages and um so if and the sex so if they are a 45 year old patient and they're male then and their height is let's say they're not that tall in between so they expect their peak flow there should be around 6 30 or so all right so it will be what you've measured over 6 30 times 100 percent and if you can get md calc uh if you have the algorithm just click on that so all this all the algorithms have clickable buttons so if you just click on that you'll be able to get the md calc algorithm for this okay and then that recorded so how does that come in into our management okay so that first, the first and most important part after you've done your ABCs, you only need to give them oxygen if they're hypoxic. Um, is are they drowsy, confused, or silent chest? Are they mild or moderate, which is a peak flow more than fifty percent, or are they severe, which is a peak flow less than uh, or equal to fifty percent of predicted? Okay, if they're mild or moderate, start your neb nebulizations, albutamol, uh, ibuprofen, and bromide, and it's how to combine that into a flow thing. Uh, into a nebulizer and then give them that for nebulization and then if your patient can swallow or not then you give them steroids so there is no difference be giving, between giving them prednisone tablets or iv hydrocortisone so you do not have to give iv steroids if your patient can swallow if the patient can swallow the drugs will work equally as well they don't, they don't have to be iv for severe patients uh, essentially they will end up with an iv hydrocort uh, because most of them will not be able to swallow but for patients who are drowsy, confused, silent chest, yeah, consider intubation if they're not moving at all. And this, some, some, you can use ketamine uh, for their intubation purposes. Um, in terms of start nebulization, give them steroids. But this is a group that you need to give magnesium. Okay, two grams in 5% dextrose over 20 minutes. It's a one-off dose of magnesium, so you don't have to repeat that. Um, but so any patient who deteriorates, to this side or you've done these two parts and an hour later they're still after three doses of drugs they're still not getting any better then you need to give them magnesium okay uh, so in patients whose peak uh, uh, peak expiratory flow fails to reach more than six percent of predicted personal best after one hour of treatment they need to get magnesium okay so patients who can go home uh, they have peak flows above six to eight percent no distress, physical exam, normal, uh, response sustained 60 minutes after the last treatment. Okay, and then they go home and follow up with their chest physicians. All right, let's quickly look at the questions. Any special precautions while taking peak flows in the current COVID-19 era? Of course, yes, you will have to, but you should be wearing your own PPEs in terms of um, surgical masks and things like that. D. Hassan, Dr. Hassan, no sound. I'm not sure about that. I think everyone else seems to be hearing. Magnesium sulfate infusion dose. Uh, maybe, Dr. Hassan, you can reconnect and see if that works. Magnesium sulfate, it's in the algorithms. Two grams uh, in 5% dextrose over 20 minutes. All right. Um, good job. On, okay. D. Hassan, sound. Um, I think everyone else. Flow chart not visible uh flow chart you can get them from and the dosages for all your drugs are actually in the algorithms um your adrenaline dosages um and uh your protropium salbutamol now interesting enough because i know some places don't have nebulization okay you can give i am oh i'm sorry subcutaneous adrenaline okay so in areas where nebulization is not available that is actually recommended. You can give adrenaline, one in a thousand, 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams subcutaneously every 20 minutes for three doses, okay? So where you do not have nebulization, feel free to use adrenaline. It's well recommended, okay? And your steroid dosages are there um, that can be used. All right, let's see if we go and go back to our patients. 
All right, so back to our differentials. Remember, shortest of breath. So we've seen a patient having an anaphylactic attack. We've seen a patient having an acute uh, asthma exacerbation. COPD exacerbation is more or less the same thing. Management is more or less the same. When you're dealing with salbutamol debilization, really, we'll be using uh, hypertropion doesn't really show much difference. But trust me, with the COPD, you just throw everything at them uh, because you really don't want to intubate them, okay? So those are potential airway presentations that could be life-threatening that you really need to pick up and be able. So other presentations that I said, it's either airway problem, a breathing problem, it's either pneumothorax, pneumonia, circulation problem, which is around your heart failure, ACS, PE, tamponade, anemia patients, and then other causes could be anxiety and metabolic disorders. All right, so case three. Okay, this should be exciting. So 55 year old patient presenting with two week history of cough and shortness of breath. Uh, that's his X-ray on the side there. And I'm going to put up the poll now. Uh, so patient presents with trick history of cough, shortness of breath. Um, you do an x-ray, it looks like that. For those, for those of guys who have the app and follow our updates on the app, this case was on the app. Um, so you should, some of you may actually have seen the case. Um, well, lung collapse, okay? Lung collapse, which is the majority of people who answer that is actually correct. Okay, so this patient probably secondary to TB, COPD, just has lung collapse. Okay, the patient's left lung has just collapsed. That's it. Okay, so when you're seeing, and uh, there's an explanatory video that's going to play next. So the lung collapse could have been secondary to COPD. It's not something. Uh, in our setting, you should also think about things like TB. Okay, a TB could be a presentation. Uh, it's definitely not attention pneumothorax. The explanation for this will be in the next video. Pneumonia causing lung collapse potentially um, because normally it's secondary to blockage of your airways and then all the alveolus uh, start collapsing. So pneumonia, probably not. Malignancy could cause lung collapse. So think malignancy, I'd be more malignancy, COPD that's blocked, blocked or something. Down the line, yes, pneumonia is something, but definitely not on top of my list. I'd have to look at that clinical presentations, but on the x-ray is lung collapse. Okay, so let me see what the questions are. So lung collapse, yes, yes, all everyone who's putting lung collapse. Uh, so let's look at the discussion around this, how to, so I'll, this is a discussion about how to diagnose that pneumothorax, also installed the pneumothorax, uh, but then we'll go back to the x-ray to look at why it's not a uh, tension pneumo. Where, where it's not a pneumothorax, on, but a lung collapse. What will I gain from this video? After watching this video, you'll know how to search for and identify a pneumothorax. The radiological pleura is abnormal if the pleural space becomes visible and the grayscale image is too black, too white, or too black and too white in combination. We have learned that the pleural space is a potential space that can accumulate fluid and air. When air enters into the pleural space, it'll rise to the most superior part of the thorax. If further air accumulates, then the air will accumulate lateral and even inferior to the lung. In order to identify a pneumothorax, we need to identify the black air within the pleural space and to differentiate that from the air within the lungs. Here we can see the pneumothorax within the right apex. There are no vascular markings identified whatsoever in this region, but we can also identify the clear margin of the lung because we can identify the visceral pleura as this thin line outlining the lateral aspect of the lung in this region. Can you identify the pneumothorax on this examination? Please pause the video and have a look. If we look at the apices of both lungs, we'll see that there is a slight asymmetry on the left as compared to the right. And that is because we have a pneumothorax on the left. This edge represents the edge of the lung. Knowing that it can be quite difficult to identify a pneumothorax on an inspiration film, if a pneumothorax is suspected, an expiration film should also be ordered. On an expiration film, the pneumothorax will be more evident 
because on expiration there's less lung air, therefore the lungs will look whiter, making the density difference between the pneumothorax and the lungs more evident, and the size of the pneumothorax will appear larger. In this case, a expiration film was obtained, and the expiration film shows the large left pneumothorax as well as significant volume loss within the left lung on expiration. Attention pneumothorax is a pneumothorax that has increased in size significantly and is now causing displacement of the mediastinal structures to the contralateral side. When this happens, there can be cardiovascular compromise, and this is a medical emergency. So how do we identify a pneumothorax? The first step is to make sure that the patient is properly centered and is not rotated. Next, we need to understand what kind of examination was performed. In this case, we have markers telling us that this was an expiration film. Next, we look for asymmetry in the apical regions, knowing that the pneumothorax, or the air within the pleural space, will rise to the highest point. In this case, we can identify that the right apical region is blacker than on the left. The next step is to look for the edge of the lung. And here we can clearly identify a thin line which represents the visceral pleura. On this side of this line, there is increased blackness from the pneumothorax, confirming that this is a pneumothorax. If you're still having difficulties identifying the pneumothorax, then outline each of the ribs on the suspected side. This is the first rib, the second rib, the third rib, superior cortical outline, inferior cortical outline. Here's the superior cortical outline of the fourth rib and the inferior cortical outline of the fourth rib. And between the third and fourth rib, there is an additional line, and this is the edge of the pneumothorax. In this case, the patient who developed acute, sharp chest pain, we see a large pneumothorax, which is causing collapse of the left lung and displacement of the mediastinal structures to the right. This is a large tension pneumothorax. This is another example of a tension pneumothorax with significant collapse of the right lung and mediastinal shift to the left. Can you identify the pneumothorax on this case? Please pause the video and take a look. So in this case, we can identify a linear density extending superiorly. This represents the edge of the lung, and this is the pneumothorax. The expiration view exaggerates the appearance of the pneumothorax on the right. Can you identify the pneumothorax on this examination? Please pause the video and try. So in this case, we can identify the clear line of the visceral pleura in the left apex and the paucity of markings and increased blackness within the left apex, consistent with the left apical pneumothorax. In this case, we have a large pneumothorax on the left with areas of subsegmental atelectasis within the lung as well as overall volume loss within the lung and mild mediastinal shift to the right consistent with early tension pneumothorax. In this case, the patient's had previous pleural disease and has developed a pneumothorax. Because of the previous pleural disease, the air within the pleural space is unable to extend to the apices, giving this unusual loculated appearance to the pneumothorax. Can you identify the pneumothorax in this case? Please pause the video and take a look. So in this case, again, we can identify a edge that should not be present, and this is the edge of the lung and the visceral pleura with a left-sided, small left-sided apical pneumothorax. So in summary, a small pneumothorax can be easily missed. A large pneumothorax can be life-threatening. Air in the pleural space will rise to the highest point. The thickness of the visceral pleura is similar to the thickness of the fissures. So the main thing about the pneumothorax is to, if you can get an expiratory film, better, okay? Um, 
Then, as you have you seen the video, that will be a take home message. You can always ask a radiographer, take an expiratory film if you're suspecting a pneumothorax, and you should be able to see the exaggeration of the pneumothorax. Now, in terms of management for pneumothoraces, I know everyone just automatically jumps to chest tubes. We are slowly but surely should be moving away from chest tubes. Um, bulk of your patients will not need a chest tube. They'll need uh, small pigtail catheters, which are much smaller, much more comfortable for the patient, less scarring and less traumatic for the patient. Um, so for so in there's the nice algorithm about managing pneumothoraces. So small pneumothorax, if the patient is unstable or it's bilateral, they need a chest strain. So again, these are patients who put a pigtail catheter. Pigtail catheters are like your central lines, uh, but they're specifically, uh, they have a bit of a coil at the end, that's why they're called pigtail catheters. And then I, and if you Google online, uh, check our website, you'll find out how to insert a pigtail catheter uh, on YouTube and for a pneumothorax, really good. So if your patient is stable and it's just a one-sided pneumothorax, if they're above 40s, so significant smoking history, if there's underlying lung disease on chest X-ray, then the next question is, uh, is it primary pneumothorax or secondary pneumothorax? So primary pneumothorax means it's spontaneous. Tall, thin people tend to have, or patients with underlying lung disease tend to have spontaneous pneumothoraces. Uh, secondary pneumothorax uh, could be uh, secondary to trauma, for example, or, okay, sorry, secondary underlying lung disease, okay? So if it's small, less than two centimeters, patient not short of breath, they can be discharged home, okay? They don't need to be admitted. Uh, if it's above, if it's more than two centimeters, this is measured from the largest, so largest pocket measured from the inner part, inner aspect of the lung uh, of the thoracic cavity. Uh, it's more than two centimeters of breathless, you can do aspiration of the pneumothorax. Uh, and this can, you get, there are videos on how you can aspirate the pneumothorax safely, which works a lot well and prevents you having to put a chest tube. Of course, if your aspiration fails, they need a chest strain. So bulk of these patients, apart from trauma patients, or even there is some studies that I look at trauma patients with uh, pneumo, hemoneumos and pigtail catheters. I also worked on them. So trending is away from those fat, big chest tubes that we put to more pigtail catheters. Um, so you can read around that, uh, but that's where we should be headed. Um, no one, to be honest, if I had a pneumo, please try and put a pigtail. You can get access to one. Of course, that's also a limiting, limitation in our setting. Um, Secondary pneumothoraces, again, this one's there. We don't, if they more than centimeter breath, let's put a tube. People. One to two, try aspirate. If they fail, let more than one put a tube, uh, chest strain. If you aspirate and they're fine and they're less than one, um, then you can admit high flow oxygen. So what oxygen does, it does what, uh, so giving oxygen to patients with spontaneous pneumothoraces also has been shown to be therapeutic. There's a study that actually looked at conservative management of these patients and bulk of them did quite well, but they are in settings where you can follow them up. But what oxygen does is actually just does a nitrogen. Remember, if you, your air composition is 79 or so percent uh, nitrogen and 21% oxygen or so. So if you give patient pure oxygen, it washes out all the nitrogen in your lungs. So even a pneumothorax that was this big, cause it's still air, once the nitrogen washes out, it kind of collapses down and uh, as all the 79% of the nitrogen is washed out by the oxygen. So that's the theory behind giving patients with pneumothoraces oxygen to reduce the size of the pneumothoraces. But this, of course, in stable patients, not in patients who need to adjust to input immediately. All right, so back to our differentials. Um, so we've looked at pneumothoraces, a potential cause of shortness of breath. Uh, just a quick discussion on this x-ray as we discussed. So I know the pathology, most people think about x-ray is if it's pushing things on one side, then there's a pneumothorax that's pushing things on that side. But if you look at this x-ray, there's actually lung markings all over on the on the right that yeah, on the right side of the patient's chest. So there is lung. So it's not always things are being pushed, sometimes things are being pulled. Okay. So in this situation, things are being pulled down. So as the lung collapses, uh either secondary to a mute in this particular case, uh from the source it was more of a cancer patient and so the lung was had blocked and the air essentially collapsed there all the um all the lobules of the lung collapsed so essentially because of that it was pulling on the structures uh because of the loss of volume on this side 
Another thing that can quickly tell you there's loss of volume. As you can see, there's crowding on the ribs on this side compared to this. There's more splaying. The ribs are more well spaced out on this side. This one is more crowded. So this should not be at the situation of pressure and tension. So this, as you can see, all this ribs. So this is loss of volume on this side. It's pulling in on the track. And that's why it looks like a tension. But what is rules out the tension is we can clearly see all the lung markings on this side. Um, there is no flattening of this. Sulcus is nice and not that deep. So uh, this is a patient who's compensating by just breathing on one lung. Okay, so that's why it looks a bit big. All right, so good on that. All right, so here's our next case on the chart. All right, um, now we got supplemental oxygen. So I'm looking at the chart. Uh, is it necessary to humidify oxygen? If No, no humidification, not necessary, no. Uh, would you share the link to the video, please? Uh, that will be shared uh, through Dr. Online or our website. Uh, trauma patients, multiple rib fractures, no evidence of pneumothorax. Can you prophylactically put a chest tube if you're unable to repeat chest X-ray frequently? If there's no evidence of a pneumothorax, so you're either putting a chest tube because of, uh, uh, what's this thing called? Uh, hemothorax uh or pneumothorax if you can't see them especially with multiple rib fractures you probably need to have your patient first on niv as a starting point uh because you need over time because of the rib fractures they will not be breathing well they'll get um pulmonary contusion lung collapse and all other infections that come up from not breathing properly so should you prophylactically my answer to that would be no uh but what you do is keep an eye on your patient and your clinical exam still uh, works. If there's deterioration in terms of shortness of breath and their first thought process should be around a pneumothorax developing. And in that situation, if you are unable to get an X-ray, no, uh, then potentially you can do, do the chest tube then as a, but work on your clinical examination skills, reduction of breath sounds, reduced air entry, uh, all this will lead you to a pneumothorax. Ultrasound can be used to diagnose pneumothorax. Um, for those who've learned point of care ultrasoundography, we should have a session on that. Uh, we we'll actually should plan a session on that. And all the cool things you can do with an ultrasound, and that can help you diagnose your pneumothorax. All right. So, and then cues highlight on needle decompression. Uh, needle decompression is again people are kind of moving away from that to more about to finger thoracostomy. So finger thorax, so previously we used to say stick a needle, second acostal space, mid clavicular line, right? And no harm in doing that. Okay. But the thing is, a good depending on the the body habitus of your patient, your technique, it may, may not work. The recommendation now for finger thoracostomy is the same place you're gonna put a chest tube, fourth or fifth intercostal space, anterior to your mid axial line. Just dig a hole. Okay, well, cut a hole. Like you're putting a chest, you put your finger in, let the air out with your finger. Okay, well, let's by pushing your finger through. Okay, that's now what is more recommended than you sticking needles all over the patient's front chest. Okay, differentiate lung collapse from hemothorax. Uh, again, so hemothorax, there'll be no that uh, collapse, um, narrowing of the ribs uh, or the, the ribs being closer together. Your costophrenic junk. Uh, angle will disappear with a hemothorax uh, but then of course also then the you would not have that shift so hemothorax will probably push structures versus pulling structures uh any role for a little compression answer that one all right okay so let's look at this patient see what's happening to them sick honestly if you have chest honestly i don't know i don't know what it is if the chest and left arm isn't good. I know, I know that. I'm saying left arm could just be a cramp. It could be bad sleep. It's right here. It's like a muscle thing. Right here. All the way up to here. It's here, here, here. It's just a... So this is a patient who's now from his boat has been brought to your ED. Um, what's your immediate management? Let me see the chat question here. All right, Winnie. Uh, use the poll. 
And let's have a look at that. Okay, interesting. Okay, good. So the bulk, 55% answered, get an ECG. Yes, that's the correct answer. Let's just have from that. Now, oxygen, bulk of your patients. So this patient is having a heart attack, essentially. So that's important, okay? Bulk of your patients do not need oxygen. If you joined us in our last uh, presentation last week, shortness of breath is not equals to hypoxia, okay? Patients who present with shortness of breath do not mean they're hypoxic. A lot of studies are looking at things like, especially in heart attack patients and uh, stroke patients, if your saturations are above 90%, you do not need oxygen. So if the correct answer was get, check a pulse oximeter before give oxygen, yes, that would be the correct answer. But do not reflexly give these patients oxygen because bulk of them, A, do not need it, B, will be harmful to the patient, uh, especially... So extra oxygen has been shown to cause oxygen radicals, which increase the inflama inflammation that's ongoing and pretty much causes poor outcomes for this patient. So for a regular patient, if your saturation is above 94, you don't need oxygen. For your stroke and heart attack patients, if your saturation is above 90%, you do not need oxygen, okay? So that's on that. Chest X-ray will show you nothing. So yeah, he'll die based on his clinic. So he has a typical presentation for a heart attack. He has epigastric pain, chest pain, left arm pain. He's trying to justify it in many other ways, but that's a heart attack until proven otherwise. So getting an ECG on your patient will be the priority uh, to make sure that we are not missing a heart attack. Uh, COVID-related pneumonia. Okay, so just quickly before I go to the next slide. Interpretation of pulling or pushing, uh, that is actually just based on looking at the x-ray. So if you have a big pneumothorax, you will see that pushing up. Well, you will see the structures moving and because of the pressure from the pneumothorax. So the interpretation is in relation to whatever pathology you're seeing uh, on the x-ray. Okay, uh, COVID-related pneumonia. How is COVID-19 related to pneumonia? COVID-19 is a pneumonia. Let me just put it that way. Um, and it's like uh, just a viral pneumonia. That's what that is. All right. So good. So let's look at what happened to this patient. Okay. So they get to your ED and voila, someone decides to do an ECG. Okay. Uh, we have done an ECG series at some point. So you can look at our past video uh, uh, presentations. Uh I don't know what Levin sign is, Tracy. Maybe you can chat, uh, you can type it out there for us to see that. All right, but here's a good explanation on this ECG. Uh, for those who are not comfortable looking at ECGs, if you go to Dr. Online or you go to our website, you will find a whole ECG series that we did uh, sometime back that shows you how to interpret ECGs. But we can look at the interpretation for this ECG. All right, so this is another really important case. This one of a very young 32-year-old man who actually walked into the ER complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath. This was his 12 lead ECG that was recorded in triage. Now let's look at the limb leads first. What jumps out more than anything else in the limb leads to me are the inferior leads, leads 2, 3, and AVF. These are contiguous leads, and all three of these leads show ST depression with down-up biphasic T waves. Remember this, ST depression with down up biphasic T waves. Every single time you see this pattern in the inferior leads, you should think to yourself that this is reciprocal to transmural ischemia of the high lateral wall, and that means leads one in ABL. And you should immediately then look in these leads for evidence of acute myocardial injury. And lead ABL here has a very concerning ST takeoff with ST elevation. This should concern you every time you see this ST morphology. And these are classic hyperacute T waves broad, wide, relative to the QRS complex is huge uh, T waves. Same thing in lead one. Uh, these are hyperacute T waves of transmural ischemia. So the limb leads show transmural ischemia of the highlateral wall. Now we turn to the precordial leads and look what we see here. Very significant ST elevation in lead V1 with huge T waves towering over the QRS complexes in lead V2 and V3 and V4. Uh, there's the beginning of Q wave formation here and uh, there's ST depression in leads V5 and V6. The reason for that is these depressions are reciprocal to the septal uh, myocardial infarction, and that's uh, the ST elevation lead V1. And so all in all, this ECG is screaming a very, very proximal LAD occlusion, proximal to S1, the first septal perforator, and 
proximal to D1, the first diagonal branch. And uh, this patient was rushed to the cath lab and look at this very impressive cath. This is the left main here. This is the left circumflex. And you can see that there's barely any LED before you get this 100% thrombotic occlusion with Timmy Zero flow that was opened up and stented. All right, good. All right, let's have a look at the quest. Uh, STEMI, STEMI, STEMI. Yes, a lot of people picked up on the STEMI. Okay, so it's uh, anteroceptral MI. Yes, good job on that. That's explained. Uh, not lateral, it's anteroceptral. Clenched fist on the anterior chest, secondary to chest pain is a quick spot diagnosis for MI. Uh, oh, yeah, thanks, Trin. That's Levin sign. Thanks, Tracy. Um, and then Daniel, I trusted on MI. So I think we're all clear. So and that can easily be a presentation for a patient with shortness of breath. And you should look out for this. Um, so not just and uh, not just any shortness of breath is a lung pathology. It could easily be a cardiac pathology. And what we're going to look at here now is our ACS algorithm. Um, if I can find the uh, find chest pain. Yes, so here's a chest pain algorithm. All right, so chest discomfort, uh, which may be suggestive of ischemia, is or oh, general equivalence, for example. So exertional pain with ear, jaw, neck, shoulder, arm, back, or epigastric area pain, exertional dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, fatigue. So all these symptoms in a patient meeting the criteria uh, with the appropriate risk factors uh, for ACS will present that. And as you can see, you need to get a 10, 12 lead ECG. In fact, 12 lead ECG, and if you're thinking there's right-sided 13 lead ECG, um, this patient needs to go to a hospital that has access to a cardiologist um, and or you should be able to thrombolize uh, patients as quickly as possible in case they're having a STEMI. But you go down the algorithm, uh, what to look out on the ECG, you see, give oxygen only if saturations are less than 90% or if patient is dyspneic, maintain saturations just above 90%. But the key thing is that's being... Um, the requirement right now. So again, other con remember life-threatening cause of chest pain, pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade, aortic dissection, tension pneumothorax, esophageal rupture. I think you need to factor in. But look at your ECG. Look at the things we were talking about in terms of hyperacute tall T waves, wide tall T waves, ST elevations, um, the takeoff that you're seeing that. So all this you can get on the algorithm. So if you're seeing this on your ACG, then you're probably working with a STEMI and you need to go down the STEMI algorithm. Um, how does one diagnose an end STEMI? Good question. Okay. So when we get to this point is either you're having a STEMI or an unst uh, unstable angina or end STEMI, or you're saying it's low risk uh, unstable angina, okay? So if your ECG looks, so STEMI is a purely, this is an ECG diagnosis, okay? This is a lab diagnosis, uh, and STEMI, and STEMI specifically is a lab diagnosis, okay? Uh, because you need positive troponin. Your troponin are negative, then to be an unstable angina. So all the patient clinical presentations, ECG is not a STEMI, um, troponins come back negative, then it's unstable angina, but, if we so if we go down specifically to the NSTEMI algorithm, okay. Um so NSTEMI can either be so patient can either be unstable angina, NSTEMI, or low risk unstable angina. So you need to get your lab tests, essentially looking at troponin tests. Okay. They still need to get the treatments, the aspirin, the nitros, if there are no contraindications, uh, morphine, fentanyl, um, then consider chest x-ray if there's something. Now the heart score. The heart score is a good score. And this is help you risk stratify. So if you all go on the NSTEMI algorithm and you're like, ah, am I, no, am I, maybe, maybe, ideally you should be getting a troponin uh, for that patient. But also the heart score has been used to st risk stratify patients presenting with chest pain in the emergency department. It's been validated and essentially looks at uh, the mnemonic heart, H-E-A-R-T, so history, uh, is it highly suspicious, moderately suspicious, slightly suspicious? You get points for that. 
ECG, if there's ST depressions, non specific ST ch uh, depolarization changes are normal ECG, you get points. How old the patient is, you get points for that. Risk factors. So, risk factors they're looking at is diabetes, current or recent, smoker, hypertensive, hyperlipidemia, uh, highly, yeah, family history of coronary disease and obesity. So, if you have more than three risk factors, you get two points, no risk factor, zero points. Now, the thing about this still, it still needs you to do a troponin because that also adds up. But if your patient is scoring two points in multiple, remember, so if your score of zero to three, your MACE is major adverse cardiac events, your risk for MACE is very low, okay? Anyone with a score above three, so four moving upwards, uh, yeah, you have a problem, okay? So even if you do not have troponin, for example, but you score them using these fast factors and their scores are hitting above uh, three, then, um, or even just, yeah, so then you probably are having a patient having a cardiac event and you need to get them to a place where, so initiate your management, but get them to a place where they get to see a cardiologist as soon as possible because um, they probably are having an end STEMI because you ruled out STEMI on the ACG, okay? Um, on the chat, then late now, regards supplemental oxygen, this, now I've answered the supplemental oxygen one, uh, high sensitive trop, yes, uh, STEMI in our setting, we cannot access a cath lab. Yes, there are no, the cath labs are in only public hospitals, Moi, Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldoret, Kenyatta, um, and Coast General PGH. Uh, Coast, they, they're not called Coast General Teaching and Referral Hospital. All have cath labs. If you don't have a cath lab, you still have access to thrombolytic, things like streptokinase, uh, relative place. I know they're not uh uh stored they're not uh procured by the hospitals so you may need to speak to your relatives to get them oh okay UTTRH, yes KUTTRH, uh Kenya, the Kenyatta university just opened up their cath lab thank you on that one uh abdi Rahim rahman i think maybe yes thank you very much for that um yes so KUTTRH. so but thrombolytics look for streptokinase look, look for relative place find out who can supply this to you short notice in your facilities because you can give treatment with that. And if, for example, for STEMI, just going up on the STEMI algorithm, all the doses for these drugs, doses for streptokinase, relative place, they're all available. The tenecte place, alter place are quite expensive. Um, so, but these are affordable options. I'm not sure the kind of prices is one of the things we probably have to get information about, but you can access to this and you actually can use this for your patient. So uh, consider this. And then once you've stabilized a the patient, then if they can afford to get to a hospital with a cath lab, that would definitely be recommended. All right, good. All right, let's go back to our cases. Almost done for today. So again, patient presenting with shortness of breath. Is it an airway issue? Is it a breathing issue? In this particular case, we're looking at a patient having uh, acute coronary syndrome. So patient presenting with uh, ACS, presenting with shortness of breath. So again, so not every shortness of breath is lung related or airway related. It could easily be a cardiac related presentation. Any role for heparin in MI? It's very specific if you're using it in certain situations. Uh, check the algorithms on that because it varies based on the clinical presentations. And best, it actually varies based on your management and what heparin are you using. So just check it's all on the algorithms. All right, good. So here is our next patient. The vital signs are noted on the top left side. Okay. All right. And I can launch the poll for this. So what's your immediate management for this patient? Uh, there's no volume, sorry. There was no sound on this one. Gideon Mutai, quite accurate. This patient um, has deep, let me just play that video has deep, rapid breathing. They're taking a full breath, quite a huge breath, if you can see that, okay? This is what is called Kuzmo's breathing, okay? This is a child who's having a DKA, okay? Uh, and they present with this rapid, deep 
kind of so compared to a rapid shallow breathing uh which many patients present with shortness of breath will be more rapid shallow breathing this patient actually has quite as you can see the chest is uh is there's no in drawing or anything it's just huge volume expansion of the chest and that's if, uh, classic for Kuzmo's breathing so the correct answer on this one would be yeah you need to check the patient's sugar this patient has um this patient has DKA okay uh especially this child has DKA and that's being easily picked up so they don't need oxygen their situations are fine uh they probably will need fluid resuscitation uh as per the DKA management protocols uh which you can check also on the algorithms that are there um we have for the adult one you may need to pick up on the kid one and the pediatrics one but as you can see that so note the difference between this and a child potentially having a pneumonia there is less in drawing um there is no subcostal intercostal recessions and things like that this is just mm -hmm. child taking significantly large breaths because they're trying to blow out uh, all the excessive um acid in their body so they normally are trying to blow out all the co2 to compensate for the buildup of the keto acids in the patient's body so such a child cosmos breathing you and so always watch out this for patients who are potentially having acidosis and uh, always check the sugar you may just be miss sitting on a dka okay so like i said so one of the things you're looking at is as a cause of uh shortness of breath is metabolic causes okay so always check out for this so it's not just uh, your acidotic patients will present with uh this shortness of breath uh marcy your hand is up maybe you can type in the chat on the q and a we'll be able to answer that um okay so look at that look for that patient that's why you still need to do a sugar on these patients uh to make sure that you're not dealing with decay so this is a child who woke up Sugar was high before they went to sleep. They woke up in the morning. They now have this, they're unrousable. They have this deep, uh, rapid breathing, which is in keeping with um, Cosmos breathing. So check a sugar, it's probably decay. So metabolic, so acidosis. So any child, any patient with acidosis, if you think about, remember your acid-based metabolism, uh, acid-based balance system. If you have too much acid in your body, your body will try and get rid of it. The easiest way to do that is to breathe faster to get rid of CO2, uh, which then reduces your carbonic acid in your body and to compensate for the acidosis that you're having uh, from whatever source it is. So shortness of breath is a, also can be a presentation on patients with acidosis from multiple, multiple reasons for acidosis. So always consider metabolic causes as a cause of their shortness of breath. All right, and we have the last case for today. Uh, let me see, let me just play that. Okay, so I'll bring up the poll. Okay, so what's the immediate management for this patient? time is up all right good so let's look at the results hmm. so one group says do d dimers okay so i'm thinking they're working down the p algorithm and then another group says give fluids uh yeah for this one chest x-ray probably won't help you as much uh but oxygen you don't need oxygen your patient's saturating at 99 percent they, you can't go further than that. that's fine so did i versus three bolus now this was a trick question because none of these answers are actually theoretically were actually right okay because this patient doesn't need the fluid bolus why look at their maps 
they have a map of 70, okay? So if you think about the pathophysiology of uh, pulmonary embolism, which is what this patient actually has, is there's a blockage of blood flow out of the right ventricle into the lungs, okay? That's the pathophysiology. So you can imagine your heart has, these are the two, so this is, uh, this is the right ventricle and this is the left ventricle, okay? So the right one can't pump blood out, so it's slowly blocked, it's blocked. So as blood comes in, it becomes bigger and bigger, but it's not able to pump blood into the lungs because it's blocked. So if you give a fluid bolus, essentially what you're doing is you're increasing the size of the right ventricle, which then compromises the function of the left ventricle. And in this particular situation, giving a fluid bolus will be detrimental to your patient. Okay, because you will be stretching and increasing the volume of the right ventricle, which then will cause it to push into the left ventricle, that reducing the functionality of the left ventricle. Your patient is perfusing well, their maps are fine. Okay, their maps are above 65, they are perfusing well. They don't need a fluid bolus. In PE, in pulmonary embolism, fluid bolus will be detrimental to the patient. Okay, uh, so let's just quickly look. Uh, this video that talks about PE, then you can go through the algorithm. Hello, in this video we're going to look at pulmonary embolism. This is an overview of pulmonary embolism, an introduction. So pulmonary embolism is a sudden occlusion in a pulmonary artery or lung artery. The occlusion is usually a result of a blood clot that originates from a deep vein thrombosis. So let us look at some signs and symptoms of someone who has pulmonary embolism the person will experience a gradual increase in heart rate, tachycardia. They'll experience dyspnea, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, unilateral chest pain, hypotension, low blood pressure, and of course a sign could be signs of deep vein thrombosis. Here I'm drawing a vein. If we zoom into the brain, we can see that within this blood vessel, there is a thrombus forming, a blood clot. The thrombus is forming through a process known as thrombosis. The thrombus, the blood clot, can dislodge. When it dislodges, it becomes an embolus. The embolus can travel through the vein. It travels through the vein and up towards the heart. So now let's um, look at this area, the heart. So here I'm drawing the heart and the lungs. The heart connects to the lungs via the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins brings blood back to the heart. When the embolus reaches the heart, the heart will pump the embolus to the lungs. The embolus can then lodge or get stuck inside um, one of the pulmonary vessels and thus resulting in pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism can result in an infarct to lung tissue. So zooming into this area, we can see that here we have the pulmonary artery and the embolus has lodged in this area, resulting in pulmonary embolism. If we were to take an x-ray of a person who has pulmonary embolism, here are some features that we could see. One, we could see dilated pulmonary vessels. Two, there may be presence of fluid, pleural effusion. You can have an elevated hemidiaphragm. And finally, you can have a wedged opacity. And this is due to the infarct that resulted from the pulmonary embolism. What are some risk factors for someone to develop pulmonary embolism? Well, one common risk factor is pregnancy. Other risk factors include increasing age, having a cardiopulmonary disease, a malignant disease, being immobile, and having a serious orthopedic surgery, such as of the hip or knee. Other risk factors also include fracture. A fracture can result in a fat embolus traveling to the heart. And also varicose veins increases the chance of developing pulmonary embolism. The standard management of pulmonary embolism include oxygen, painkillers, fluids, the administration of heparin IV, warfarin orally, and in case of emergencies, thrombolytics. So that was an introduction to pulmonary embolism. Thank you for watching. All right.
CTPA, yes, uh, this patient definitely needs a CTPA. So let's quickly look at the algorithm and then uh, close on this. Um, share that. Yes, so it's a PE algorithm, okay? So it goes down. So what we have of uh, latest practice, because there have been multiple, multiple different risk factors, stratification. So your gut feeling, so my gut, especially not a PE based on risk factors. So uh, you can either use that if you regularly see this patient or the world score, or we have another year's criteria. Does the patient have clinical signs of DVT, hemoptysis? PE is the most likely diagnosis. If the answer is uh, patient is in cardiac arrest, uh, then the next thing you look at is the patient in cardiac arrest uh, or hypotensive. Systolic less than 40, then vasopressors, uh, or vasopressors required to maintain systolics above 90, despite fluid sustentions, as we drop more than 40, all this. If the answer to this is yes, then they need an echo, bedside echo, and they need to be thrombolyzed. If they are answer is no, then you have the year's criteria, using the year's criteria to evaluate this. Um, so, but if your patient is hemodynamically stable, means vital signs are fine or hypoxic, nothing else. So they have low, no year's criteria. They don't have any of these three. Then you normally take them down what you call the pulmonary embolus rule out criteria, PAC rule. And if any of this is negative, then they can go home. You should only need the dimers on this. Now, in your patients who have years criteria or they were initially cardiac arrest or hypotensive or they do not pack out, then we need to do D-dimers on them. And then now based on their D-dimer, so you need the quantitative, the ELISA D-dimers, not the qualitative ones, not the ones that says positive or negative. You need the ones that actually give you numbers, the, quant the actual quantity. Um, so D-dimers have been in and out of practice. In my patient, for example, in this video, I just go straight to a CTPA. The DDMAs will add no value in my management. Uh, the CTPA will have more. The patient is high risk for PE, clinically has signs of PE. Um, I'd go for CTPA. So this is the algorithm where you're not 100%. You are iffy. They've not been able to pack out. And then, but yeah, so I am not a fan of DDMAs. Um, They give more answers. I mean, they give more problems than solutions. Um, yes, so Abdraman, that's correct. Uh, the demons have a high negative predictability by low positive predictability. Come in, comment on this whether new assays are no, new assays are not. It's still the demons are the same. The problem about the demons is the demons can be positive for any particular reason. I could have beaten you a few slaps to yesterday and your demons would go up. You could have tripped and fallen last week, your demons would be up. So remember, the demons are breakdown products of coagulation. So uh, and it is on, and you are always coagulating and coagulating yourself. So positive D dimers normally create more problems than solutions. My my take on this, and this is again purely based on experience, is if I think you have a PE, I'm taking you to CTPA. If I don't think you have a PE, your ECG is running at, you don't have any tachycardia, you don't have any hypoxia, your risk factors are low. I will take you down the pack rule, and if you're not fitting any of the criteria, I will stop there. Okay, I will not order the diamonds. So um, in terms of, can you give anything prophylactic for PE in patients with crash injuries, the purpose of FEMA? Uh, yes, there are prophylactic doses for surgical patients. I'm not an expert on that one. You may need to contact check with your surgeons or your medical teams. Um, uh, yeah, in the ED, I do not start prophylaxis, nothing. <laughs> yes, uh, those ones are done by the inpatient team. So consult those ones. All right, but yeah, so it's, my thought process is you are sick because you're having a tacky or you're hypoxic or you have every reason you should be having a PE, go to CTPA. You are well, you maybe just have a bit of chest pain, but that's it. ACG, there's no tachycardia, you're not hypoxic. I will take you down. You don't meet any of the years criteria. You don't meet any of these things in the park rule. I will stop there. I will probably not do a demo on you, okay? Um, and that your risk factors, your risk for still having a pee is so small that it doesn't eliminate it, but it's as small as, yeah, it's not, it's something can happily send you home on. Yeah, all right. So that's on that discussion of a pee. All right, it's two minutes to 8.30, so we should be summarizing. So yes, in summary, okay, we're still starting off from where we last started last week in terms of, does your patient have a pulse? Yes or no. Is there a trauma? Yes or no. Is the airway open? Mention about you need to intubate. 
uh, in your breathing, you're assessing the rate, the air entry color, effort, SPO2, the uh, mnemonic for that is races. In your circulation, you're looking for rate, uh, level of consciousness, looking at ABPU, color, ACG, systolic blood pressure, also mnemonic is races. In disability, you're checking your GCS pupils and, uh, and your sugars. So red flags in any patient presenting with shortness of breath is sudden onset, bad asthma history, fever, cough, chest pain, uh, patients with risk factors for uh, acute coronary syndromes, patients with risk factors for PE. These are red flags. So these are the things you really want to flag your patient. Okay, was it a sudden onset chest uh, shortness of breath? That's a problem. Do you have a bad asthma history? Essentially, it means we are going down south. Okay, any patient with fever, cough, then you're thinking pneumonia and whatever that cause of pneumonia there. Chest pain, I'm thinking cardiac causes, okay? And I'm also thinking, what are your risk factors for having a heart attack? What are your risk factors for having a PE? Uh, Marcy, please uh, type on the chat. All right, the next thing I'm looking for. So once I've figured out your risk factors, I'm doing a proper uh, head, uh, eyes, ear, nose, and throat exam on you. Are you having an anaphylactic reaction? Are your airways closing that I'm not picking this up? So what's happening there? Okay, I'm listening to your chest. I'm seeing the intracranial deviation. That, though that's normally on an X-ray, not really clinically. Uh, is your is your jugular venous pressure this your jugular veins distended? For example, JVP is up. Are you wheezing? Are you having rails, ronca? Is your chest silent? That is a big problem with silent. Then I'm going down your cardiovascular system. Can I hear S1 and S2, gallops, mamas, any rubs? And then I'm always, so anyone with shortness of breath, always examine the extremities for leg swelling, edema, pulses. Make sure there's, they're not bringing a DBT down there or features of heart failure also, your edema on the lower limb. So an extremity exam is as important in any patient presenting with shortness of breath. Because if you look for those, then yeah you may need not consider again here it's only if necessary do i need an ecg do i need to check for anemia remember anemia is one of the causes of shortness of breath uh do i need to check their metabolic panels are they acidotic for example uh if it's cardiac am i thinking do i need a troponin uh d dimers if i'm really going down that route or am i going straight to ctpa chest x-ray is good for your pneumonias pneumothoraces uh lung pathology not really that good for your pe's and cardiac issues um and then ultrasound is good for everything and we will definitely have a session on uh, point of care ultrasonography and all the cool things you can learn to do with an ultrasound um because if you do all that and um, you investigate your patient as appropriate, you may just find one of these common causes of life threatening causes of shortness of breath that should not be missing out in the emergency department. Mm -hmm.